We don't know what a proton looks like. You were probably told that it looks like a sphere of charge inside of an atom. But this isn't correct. At university, you were probably told that a proton is a combination of up and down quarks. But this is also wrong. You may have even heard that a proton is a combination of quarks and gluons that are contained within what we traditionally thought of as a proton. Well, it seems like even this is wrong. A proton is both heavier and lighter than we think it is. It is both larger and smaller than we think it is. But how can these statements be true? And what was wrong with the previous picture of a proton? Let's discuss it. Protons have always confused us. We seem to continuously misunderstand them. In early experiments on electrical charge and current flow, we thought that positive charges moved, not the much smaller negative charges of electrons, which we now know is the true moving charge. In fact, we still denote current flow as the flow of positive charge, the opposite to the actual flow of electrons. But our confusion hasn't stopped there. It was more than one century ago that Ernest Rutherford discovered that positively charged particles are at the heart of every atom. And it turns out that physicists are still struggling to fully understand what exactly a proton is. Every time we thought we finally understood what a proton was, we looked a little deeper and found more. And recent results have dramatically changed the narrative once again. But before we get into that, what is the story of developing our understanding of the proton? We originally thought that protons were fundamental particles, just like electrons. That is, they were made up of smaller particles, but we were very wrong. And in order to find out what protons are made of, we had to do just one thing, smash them. But of course, smashing atomic particles into their constituents isn't the easiest thing to do. We need to build large particle colliders in order to do this. Our ability to look at small things is ultimately limited by the energy that we use to look at them. Optical microscopes are limited by the wavelength of the light that we use, which is called the diffraction limit. If we use blue light, we can see smaller details than if we use red light because blue light has more energy than red light, both of which have an energy of a few electron volts. Electron microscopes have an amazing resolution, partly because the electrons used have such a high energy, which is of the order of tens of kilo electron volts. I mean, look at these amazing images, but this is still nothing compared to looking inside of a proton. To understand them, we needed higher and higher energies. Our first look inside of protons was in a particle accelerator using an electron with an energy of 20 giga electron volts, roughly six orders of magnitude higher than an electron microscope. Rather than seeing a single particle, we saw scattering of several point-like particles inside of the proton. And at the right energy, we were able to isolate this down to three particles. When we first discovered this, we had no idea what these particles were. Richard Feynman called them partons and said that these particles must carry the momentum that adds up to the properties that we see in the proton as a whole. Eventually, we would begin to call these particles quarks and understand that these particles have fractional charge, such that three quarks can add up to the single positive charge of a proton. Okay, great. The proton is made up of three quarks two up quarks and one down quark. No, this is too simple. It appears that nature doesn't like to make things simple. While the proton does contain these particles, it is not the only particles that it contains. If we look at different energy scales, rather than seeing three quarks, we instead observe a sea of gluons, which are fundamental particles that mediate the strong interaction between quarks. This keeps the quarks bound together rather than flying away from each other. But we see more than just gluons. We observe more quarks and much bigger quarks. Particles spontaneously pop into existence and then cease to exist again shortly after. 
Now, this might not seem like it should be possible, as there should be some conservation law that prohibits it. But it does happen, and this is because it always forms a matter-antimatter pair, so that all of the fundamental quantities are conserved. This is happening all around us. Electrons and positrons form all of the time. Calculating the right energy of the proton atom requires accounting for these particles. And Stephen Hawking famously theorized that black holes can evaporate by absorbing only one of these particles, which leads to the other particle causing Hawking radiation. Well, it turns out this process is happening inside protons. And not just a little, it is happening a lot and in ways that we didn't think was possible. Just imagine what we traditionally thought of as a proton. Inside of this, we have many much smaller and lighter quarks that are spontaneously forming and annihilating. But this is okay, they're all contained inside of the proton. So this makes sense with the physics that we understand at lower energy scales. But this was until we found that there also seems to contain some much larger quark-antiquark -quark pairs. Sometimes the proton contains a charm and an anti-charm quark. You may not have heard of this quark, as they're usually only components of exotic short-lived particles formed in particle accelerators. But this is an important thing about this discovery. Charm quarks are heavier and larger than protons. So sometimes protons contain two particles that are both individually larger than the proton itself. So when we ask the question, how big is a proton? The answer is, it depends on when you look. Because if you look when there's a charms quark present, it's much larger. Every time we have thought we finally understood what made up a proton, we were wrong. We constantly find more the more we look. There is no reason to assume that we have finally understood it now. Maybe in a few years, we will find something even crazier about protons. Understanding atoms is so important to new technologies. One promising technique is to the use the fusion of atoms for power generation. Check out this video to find out when we will actually have nuclear fusion power.